All right. Uh, morning, everyone. I think all the other speakers have taken the weather jokes, so let's pick Francesinas. Who said a Francesina this week? Was it good? Did you eat all of it? Did you go back for another one? I think that's the right. You've got to eat one in full. Um, cool. So I'll be talking about modernization today. Um, a few words about me first. I'm a consultant, so filter everything in this talk through that perspective. I also organize a meetup in London, DDD London. If ever you're in the area, feel free to drop by. If ever you want to talk at the meetup, um, always happy to have new people, first time speakers, experienced speakers, hands on sessions, talks. Um, yeah, always good. So modernization, let's start with the why. If you're a successful company, why would you want to spend any of your money and time fixing legacy systems when you can build new stuff? If you're an established company, you've got a lot of advantages already, and we can see a lot of examples of this out there. Um, you've got market share, you're making money. You've got a brand reputation and loyalty. Even if someone can build a better product than you, they still have to convince your customers that you're more reliable and trustworthy to, to switch from someone that they've known and used for potentially a number of years. Um, you might have hired the industry's most talented people. Um, you've got a budget where you can afford those more talented people. Um, you can spend more on research, send your developers to conferences. If you're a small and newer company, funds are a bit tighter, you don't have such luxuries. And also there's a lock-in and switching aspect. Again, even if someone builds a better product than you, it's not always easy for customers to migrate. On the one hand, there's the data aspect. You've got all of your data in a particular service or product. But there's also the whole ecosystem around it. When I worked at Salesforce, for example, Salesforce, um, they do a lot of interesting things. They have this big Dreamforce conference and they invite all the customers and it's like, yeah, we get to go to this conference. But Salesforce also has like a whole career and training program. I think they call it Trailhead. It's got like cartoon characters and stuff. But you can build up a lot of skills and expertise and have all these badges. And so if you've got all of your employees trained up in Salesforce and they've got all of these skills in something like Salesforce, Switching to a new product isn't simply getting your data out of one and into another. It's that whole skills, knowledge, people's careers and identities that are built up into it. So established companies have some big advantages and you might not need to modernize. But obviously we all know about some of the risks that um, established companies have. Legacy software, first of all, um, harder, to, harder to develop, difficult to work with. People don't want to work with it. So we struggle to hire people. Then we've got the organizational side too. As companies get more established, they introduce more rules and processes and structure. When you're a startup, you can get away with some things. When you work for a bigger company, you, know, you get developer laptops that are completely locked down and you can't do anything. You want to install Docker, you've got to go through like this back and forth with IT operations team for like a couple of weeks. And then they're like, oh, it doesn't work. We don't know why. So a lot of those kind of problems that bigger companies have, and those hand younger, smaller companies an advantage. Those companies can start with a blank canvas, with the latest tech, um, without the organizational baggage, without the legacy you've built up. And that, gives them a, that makes a very significant threat. Example here is OpenTable. Going back about 10 years, my friend Orlando was working there through some big modernization. Um, as you can see here, at the start, pretty common story, right? 100 developers all working in the same system, in the same code base. Build times take ages. Deployment takes ages. You do it once a month. Lots of stuff going back between dev and QA. The whole process is very inefficient. And that's, and that's that moment where a company has to make a choice. Do we just continue with this, or do we need to make an investment in modernizing some of these older systems we've got? For OpenTable, they spotted quite early that competitors were entering their market. 
and that they could see competitors innovating faster. And they had enough time to modernize and catch up without falling too far behind. Not every company does that, but yeah, OpenTable is a good example of that. And there's something else which I think is important with modernization. Um, you, can make, you can make good decisions for every day of your life. You can make good decisions about your software. And I think it's almost inevitable that over time, the environment will change and decisions you made that were good for old requirements and old constraints, suddenly something's going to be different and those old choices will put you in a position that's suboptimal. Oh, thanks. No, I don't want a software update. I thought you really liked the talk, but you were just trying to save me embarrassing myself. I appreciate both. So yeah, even if you make loads of good choices, you can still end up in a situation where your system is a long way from where you would be if you started with a blank canvas. Good example of that is Vinted. Uh, they started out building software for a single vertical, uh, women's clothing. It's not a topic I'm an expert in, or any kind of clothing, or anything related to fashion. But the idea, we can all grasp this right. Um, the company started to expand into multiple markets. So now, they're trying to add new features about other verticals that aren't about women's clothing onto these abstractions in the code base that have been exclusively designed for women's clothing, really trying to force stuff in on top. And so, I think that's what modernization really is about. That's what it is for me, rather than just a technology upgrade. It's, on a business perspective, it's usually we want to go faster and these old systems are slowing us down. And modernization is trying to be a big company that can still innovate somewhat like a younger, smaller company. You know, maybe not like for like, but um, getting close to that level. So what I'm going to talk about today, um, three parts of modernization that uh, top of my mind, I think are kind of my condensed current view. I'll talk about the flow aspect, how I think modern architecture is about flow, flow in terms of work. I'll then share with you some of the tools that I use most commonly, I see most commonly used out there, which I think you probably should learn. Other people might have five different tools, so I'm not saying they're the only tools. And then I'll talk about that interesting part where you're trying to get started with modernization. Uh, that can be pretty difficult for a lot of companies. And even when you get started, how to keep that going. Let's get a quick drink. Then we can start. So architecting for flow. When I talk about flow here, I'm talking about work. As I mentioned previously, in my experience, as a consultant mostly, when companies want to modernize, it's always about flow of work. How can we get stuff done faster? These current systems and ways of working are slowing us down. We're deploying once a month. We can see our competitors going much quicker. How can we go faster? And that's why I think it's important to recognize that to achieve that, modernization has to be more than just a technology upgrade. If you upgrade to the latest infrastructure, and if you upgrade to the latest languages, runtimes, and libraries, yeah, you'll get a benefit. You'll definitely get some benefits from that. But doing those things alone, that's not going to fix the misassumptions, complexity that's built up. And those abstractions that you designed around old assumptions, that no longer apply. So I think the concept of a value stream, which has been popularized by team topologies, is one of those fundamental building blocks we should think about. If companies want to go faster, and modernization helps us to go faster, then we need to think about how works, work flows through the organization. And that's basically a value stream. Uh, the concept's not too much more than that. From, from an idea to having something in pr production and iterating on that, that's effectively a value stream. So we can, we can strive for these value streams, and we can think we've got something that's quite loosely coupled and working independently. And we can have software systems with no visible dependencies between different parts of the system. But we do have to be aware of change coupling. So change coupling is where we make changes to multiple parts of the system at the same time. Let's say implementing some new kind of feature, and four different teams all have to touch four different parts of the system. That's a kind of almost invisible dependency. It may not be physical connections in the software 
But we have to keep that in mind. And really, we can never get away from... We're always going to have some dependencies. What we're trying to achieve here is to minimize those dependencies as much as possible. So, with that in mind, looking at how companies modernize and approach this topic of achieving faster flow, I think there are four characteristics that architects need to keep in mind when thinking about value streams and how to do value streams properly. I think the first one is on the aspect of domains. The idea here is, if we want to have work that can flow somewhat independently, we need a way to look at how do we break our business into different areas. Um, we want to look for pieces of work that are naturally cohesive. So that's what we call domains and subdomains in DDD. You might have other words for it. The second one's about being outcome-oriented. What are the business outcomes each value stream contributes to? This has some significant, significant impacts on the choices we make and helps us to validate if we're taking the right approach. If we know which outcomes a value stream contributes to, we can then start to validate the boundaries. We can see which value streams contribute more to certain business outcomes like revenue, customer acquisition, retention, and that kind of stuff. And that helps us to actually make decisions. Have we got the right boundaries? Have we introduced dependencies between value streams um, where the level of coordination is having a bigger impact on certain business metrics that we want to optimize for. Then we have the team aspect. Um, if we want to achieve fast flow, teams first need to be able to make decisions. Decisions about what to build, decisions about how to build it. If you're working in a feature factory and all the requirements are coming from outside the team into the team, that handover can increase uh, cause a number of problems. Teams aren't sure what they're building. They might build the wrong thing. Um, back and forth there. If teams can make more decisions, you'll have faster flow. And then finally, we get to the software bit. Simple idea. Can teams make changes to the code and deploy that code on demand as needed on a daily basis or whatever you think is optimal? So we'll talk a bit about these as we go through the talk. But one company that did this is iServices. They're in the domain of royalty processing. Uh, my friend Casper Gunyu works there. As you can see, as the system grew over time, it had formed um, what, what Casper explained to me as more technically driven boundaries, let's say. So I think one of the telltale signs here is the import and export system. That's got a very technical name, right? And it's also the online system. These are very technical sounding terms. And what was happening was, Teams had to understand large parts of the system. There was a lack of modularity. Team sizes grew large, lack of overlap, and they weren't able to deploy very often. So they went through a modernization process. Uh, this was the first part of the company they addressed. They identified this royalty processing domain. Thinking back to the previous slide, they went through each of these aspects. Casper and his team did techniques like event storming to map out the business first. They identified important outcomes that they were trying to optimize for. And that's what you can see here. Um, on a technical organizational level, um, deploying more frequently, but also on a business and a product level, they reduced their ingestion time by 80% and their matching process increased by 5x. So they knew what outcomes they were optimizing for. Um, and that allowed them to make choices about boundaries, architecture, team organization, where to focus, how to optimize. So there's something else that's important when we think about the old system and why you can't just rewrite it in new tech. Um, I forgot, so I need to look at the slide. Oh, yeah, that was it. So basically, there's a lot of stuff in an old system that's probably not being used anymore or is way more complex than it needs to be. And if you just set out with the intention of rewrite the old system in new tech, keep all the features, I think it's, if not 100%, then 99.9%, .9 you're going to be spending a lot of time doing the work you don't need to um, and missing out on opportunities you could get for the same level of effort. Don't know how much I trust the number on this. 80 is a nice round number. But Pendo did this research, and they reckon 80% of the features in the average software product are either not being used 
or being rarely used. So if we take that number at face value, if you rewrite an old legacy system in new tech, you keep all the features working as they are, and you just do the tech modernization, well, they're saying 80% of that work will be a complete waste. The other risk here is the, more, the, the longer modernization takes, the more people start to get a bit concerned and the more chance it has of failing and not actually modernizing the bits that um, give you the most value. So I think of modernization as kind of a stack and not the full stack you're thinking of. Um, so I think really it's a chance from, from the UI to improve you know, the customer experience. If you're going to spend a lot of effort modernizing the code, you may as well invest in the UX at the same time. But equally, there's two bits that people maybe don't think as much about at the bottom here. So the first one is the domain itself. Can you actually change how the domain works? Maybe you've got some manual processes in there, some spreadsheets. You can actually optimize those processes. Um, and the new system could be simpler and more valuable. And then probably the least, um, probably the least um, one that people think about is the domain model itself. It's a chance to really correct some of those conceptual issues that exist in your code base. Um, maybe you're in an organization where the language that the business talk and the, the words in your code have diverged significantly over time. And it's a real effort to figure out, when we talk about work over here, which bits of the code are we talking about over here? Modernization is a great chance to put a bit of effort into that domain model and fix that at the same time. And as I was talking about before, um, it might seem like a lot of extra effort to do this, and you might not go through all four layers in every part of your system, but taking a more full stack approach, you might actually, it might take less time because you've identified what doesn't need to be rebuilt or, or something that could be much simpler in the new world. Example from my career is when I worked for the UK government in 2016. Uh, where shall I start on this one? Um, I get the idea of the project was around business property taxes. Um, the government was spending too much time, losing a lot of money, had to completely remodernize it. Um, and in fact, the modernization started with the domain itself. We were modernizing government policy, business rules or government rules that had existed for decades. I'm pretty sure someone said some of these business rules might have existed for 100 years. I'm not exactly sure about that one. And uh, to build this new system, we had to change the law, basically. We were building the software and the government policy at the same time, thinking about you know, what's possible in software nowadays. How would the government need to change? How would the domain need to change to take advantage of what software can deliver? The domain model was a big part of that. There were words going around like check, challenge, and appeal. Um, people had different conceptions of what that meant. How did it tie into the old terminology? Spent a lot of time there. And a lot of effort went into the UI as well. We had user researchers in each team every week going out doing user research with citizens, taking the developers with them sometimes, um, creating videos. Every two weeks in the show and tell sessions, we'd get user insights and feedback. And so all of this was being modernized together. It was kind of a whole ongoing thing. So you don't have to do that in every part of your system, but I think you should always be asking yourself, what could we do in each of those layers? What, what feels like it makes sense? And are we just focusing on certain areas because others feel a bit harder? And I'll give you a couple of techniques uh, for the main aspect in a bit. So I wanted to share with you five tools after I share some water with myself. These aren't the only tools. They don't cover everything about modernization. But from my personal experience, what I'm using and what I'm seeing out there, I think these tools can get you quite far across some of those different dimensions. So the first one is listening. I don't just mean listening generally. But actually, what I found useful is listening tours, where you actually go out around the company. And I say this as a consultant, but I think this works if you're full-time as well. And there's a few reasons for this. But the idea is, just go talk to some people in your company. It's very tempting to look at your old system and say, 
we're five versions behind on language, or we need to move from on-prem to the cloud. But if you start talking about that too early, you're going to give your modernization a very technological narrative. People will see it as a tech thing. What you want to do is get out there, figure out what problems the people have, what are their challenges, different parts of the business, might be your support team, different products. Try and figure out what challenges they have and what goals they're working towards. Um, and then build your, modern, build your modernization narrative around those things. And then you'll shape the narrative. It will be a very business-centric. All the cloud and tech stuff you're talking about is already connected to clear business goals. And there's another benefit I found with this, which is you start building relationships and when it does become, when it does come time to start putting ideas and solutions out there, people will feel like you've listened to them, you've met them before, much more chance of getting buy-in for your ideas, and much more chance of identifying you know, who's, who's going to be a bit more difficult to convince, what concerns do they have, where some of the people issues might be. If you're not used to doing that, it can be pretty difficult. Um, I've been working with companies in the United States, and I've been up at 10 p.m. on Friday night talking to CTO, CEOs, in fact, and I'm feeling pretty uncomfortable and not nervous and not sure what to say. Um, so there is some good advice out there. It's, it's worth um, thinking about how to do these listening sessions properly. It's a pretty good skill to have, I think, whatever your job title. Um, but one of the key things to avoid too early is throwing solutions out there. So you might have a listening session and someone might be talking about the CRM. And you might say something like, oh, so uh, you'd like to replace the current in-house CRM with Salesforce. And if that's your first conversation, you're throwing solutions out there a bit too early. Before you propose any solutions, I always try and get them to share their problems and see if they have any solutions first. Maybe not even mention any solutions in that first meeting. Just try and get their pain points. Um, and I'd also be careful, again, um, when you go through these listening sessions, if you're talking about words like architecture and technology, sometimes people will feel like it's a very technical thing. And they will filter what they tell you based on what they, based on what they think architecture is, for example. So you really want to get in there and just figure out what's important to them, what are their challenges and pain points without biasing anything before the meeting or during the meeting. It's difficult, but it's useful. Um, and I think you can't really make any modernization decisions, good decisions, until you have that kind of knowledge and you can connect it to the business outcomes. And that's where another tool comes in quite effective. So this is impact mapping. You can actually use a tool like this in your listening sessions. If you're feeling a bit nervous about having an unstructured conversation with some stakeholder, you can actually just go straight to impact mapping. But the idea here is really simple. On the left, you've got some strategic business objective. In this example, 20 million plus revenue. This was an example a chief marketing officer gave to me. And on the impacts, um, what are the, which metrics do we need to improve or do we think we can improve over the next strategy cycle? Typically one year, but it can be a bit longer facing than that. And then you can talk about the deliverables. And so what you've got here is a very strong connection from here's a top level business objective, here are some product improvements you want to make, and here are some very fine grained modernization um, investments we plan to make connected to those goals. And this brings us to the next tool, uh, Wardley Mapping. It's a bit complex. I don't have time to explain all of it today. But again, from, from a ubiquity perspective, it's coming, becoming very popular. And even just the terminology in Wardley mapping is becoming quite ubiquitous. So I do think it's important to learn this tool. I'll try and give you the basic idea in like two minutes. So basically, what you can see here are some value chains. Start with a particular kind of user, discuss some of their needs, and then you talk about the components of your architecture that connect to those individual user needs. In this example, we've got a user who wants to eat some food. They use the mobile app. The mobile app talks to an ordering service. Ordering service connects to a payment service, and it runs on a cloud platform. Pretty simple and boring example. You can do much more interesting things than this. 
But the idea is simple, right? To, to connect those value chains between your architecture, users, and needs. Then what you can do is to move each of those components in the value chain to a stage of evolution. This is where things get a bit more complex, but I'll try and sum up in quite simple terms. All of the concepts in your system start out on the left in the genesis phase. It's a new idea, hasn't been done before, could be useful, might fail, we're not sure yet. On the right-hand side, you get commodity. These are things that your company built a while ago. They're boring, they're table stakes. You can't differentiate with other customers. It just has to work. So with that knowledge, about how each of your architectural components um, fits in on a strategic business level, you can start to make some quite sensible modernization decisions. Massive oversimplification, but I just wanted to get the idea across. Things towards the left, where your company can differentiate more. You want to be able to innovate faster there, obviously, to keep, keep ahead, keep adding new features. On the right-hand side, where things become a commodity, and every company does this in the same way, you can make reduced costs is one option. But over here, you might also say, we're not going to modernize stuff over here because it's not worth it. So either it's expensive to run, we need to get the cost down, we might not modernize it, or let's actually get rid of it and use an off-the-shelf tool. Those are the kind of decisions happening around there. But remember, massive oversimplification Second point about Wardley mapping. What we just looked at was the current state of a Wardley map, how you map things out where you believe they are now. The benefit of a Wardley map is that you can start to anticipate evolution, starting to ask questions like, and we're, we're talking to a mixture of stakeholders here, both on a technical level, C CEO might be there, head of product might be there, sales, marketing, any of these people could be there. What we're trying to understand is, how does each of these stakeholders anticipate that component evolving and how quickly? So I've been through examples before. Um, example would be a property management company in the United States. And basically, all of their components were going from left to right over the course of one year. It was very difficult to do something big and differentiating in that industry. So for them, the focus was always having a new stream of innovations and small improvements continuously coming out um, and not falling behind, basically. Different industries, different organizations, how things evolve can be much more different. But the, the key thing from your modernization perspective is something might be in custom and you might feel like we need to go all in and make sure we can iterate fast there. But if it's going to become a commodity in, in the foreseeable future, Maybe your competitors are all building this now, or maybe some company's building an off-the-shelf version of it. You need to be able to have that foresight to realize, yeah, it's actually not as important as it looks at first glance. Very difficult to do that, very subjective, um, but the idea is just go through this exercise with different stakeholders and ask them, how do you see components evolving? Why are components evolving? What's happening in the market? What might affect these components? just to make sure you don't want to modernize some part of your system. And here's your big launch day. And at the same time, some companies launching an off-the-shelf version of it. That would be quite embarrassing. So you, know, you just want to be a bit ahead. You can't predict the future, but we can certainly explore um, and anticipate what might happen. The fourth tool I wanted to talk about is event storming. And I appreciate I'm um, very high level on these different tools. Um, there's a lot of more detail that we could talk about and I have talked about in other talks. Event storming is really the nuts and bolts of your domain. Let's figure out how things actually work. How do our user journeys, our business processes, all of our business rules, different, um, different domain experts and customers and employees, and how are all of these people actually doing the work and using our products? So big picture event storming, is all about mapping out your current state. Um, this room would actually be great for a big picture event storming. Um, you could get probably get um, 30 people or more all doing event storming across this wall here. And you can have your whole business flow mapped out with all these different stakeholders, sales, marketing, UX, 
CEO might come, CFO might come. I've had accounting there before. All these different people mapping out how your business works. From a modernization perspective, that is really the information you want. How do people think the system works? Um, which bits of the system are people using? Um, which bits are over complex? And which, which bits aren't people using anymore? Event storming can surface all that kind of information. Event storming also has another flavor, which is process modeling. Process modeling can be used in different contexts, but it's also great for the future state. So let's imagine on big picture event storming, you've identified some parts of your domain that seem to be over complex or there's a chance to improve it. You can then use process modeling in a similar fashion to design the new version. So from a modernization perspective, you can work with those different stakeholders and define the new requirements. Here's how the current legacy system works. Here's how we want the new system to work. And that's, that's, what you modern, that's what the modernized solution should look like. Rather than rebuilding the old system, you've got some clear requirements for the new system that improve on what uh, you had before. Event storming, uh, big picture, is also a great way to start finding those domain boundaries I talked about earlier, to identify parts of your business that seem to be independent, cohesive, and loosely coupled. What's great about event storming, well, there's a few great things. The first one is exploring domain boundaries. Pretty easy. You got this timeline mapped out on the wall. You just start asking questions like, which clusters of events feel like they might be related together? You can do that on multiple levels. And what's really important about this is you've got all those different perspectives in the room at the same time. You know, it might be sales, marketing, products, etc. You can have those conversations and get those various perspectives before you start thinking about the software architecture. And the fifth tool, maybe not so much the tool that's important here, but the idea behind it is making the right choices in each part of your system, choosing the optimal level of modernization for each part of your system. Um, uh, it's easy sometimes to apply generic strategies to a whole system, but that can result in a lot of unnecessary work. So the way I think about this is across two different dimensions. And we've talked about these already. The, the first one is on the technology side. How much do you want to modernize the infrastructure, the languages and the runtimes, the libraries, the database, um, integration between different parts of your architecture? That's the technical aspect. But then you can also ask, how much do we want to modernize or improve the software itself, um, adding new features, simplifying existing features, improving the domain model, um, or maybe just accepting to work with the legacy. So one of the patterns is legacy encapsulates. The idea here is you'll go into some part of the legacy, you'll make some small changes, and you might expose a domain event that other modernized parts of the system will talk to. So I think getting that right is, is really important. You know, I think people always look for a simple a process to follow everywhere. But I think getting the maximum benefit from modernization is about picking the right strategy in each area. And if you, if you, do, if you can do less modernization in some areas, that will really give you a chance to focus on the event storming, remodeling your domain in other areas where it does matter. Yeah, so I talked about the tech, um, and these are kind of different levels you can go for on the, on the domain and the software side, from a simple polish the legacy to completely rethink the whole thing, where you throw the old code away, start from a blank canvas. As you go through these levels, typically you'll, you'll need a higher level of investment from domain experts and maybe UX experts. As you get to rethink, you're rethinking the whole user experience, business workflows, so you'll need more, more than just software um, expertise there. So that was the five tools. I just wanted to quickly say, I'm also seeing a lot of, um, a lot of interesting code scene these days, uh, tools that can provide some insights into this process. Code scene can analyze your version control history and identify which parts of the system are changing together. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. I haven't mentioned any tools, but I'm not anti-tools. Um, I think we should always be looking at tools that can help in addition to the techniques I mentioned. So 
The final thing today is about how you can get started effectively um, and how you can keep modernization moving, prevent, prevent things getting a bit stuck or uh, people losing interest. So the first thing I would say, a very common challenge is People want to try and map out all of their domains and subdomains first, have this big vision of a target architecture they want to move towards, and they're prepared to spend a lot of time doing that, um, sometimes getting close to a year. Even though I talked about stuff like Wardly mapping and event storming, I'm really not saying to do that. Um, in fact, I think most companies I've worked with benefited could have, and it was the right thing to try and modernize something in the first three to six months. Obviously, if we go down the wrong path, then we might have to reverse, we might lose some credibility, but usually there's some part of your system that obviously needs modernizing. You don't need to spend a year analyzing it. And the importance there is really just to start getting that learning engine going, learning techniques like event storming, validating your new tech stack, learning how to remodel parts of your system. Because what I find is, if you're a developer, if you've got a team of developers who've been working in a legacy code base for years, and they've been in like, you know, just get in there, fix it, try not to break anything, going from that to like, let's modernize the whole thing is a, is a big step. So, you know, picking this first project of three to six months, you can gradually start changing that mindset validating some approaches, learning techniques. And you can still do the big picture stuff in parallel. I'm not saying don't do that. Picking that first slice kind of falls into that area. It's always a bit difficult. People can often get stuck picking that first slice. Um, and generally, you're going to be at the bottom left or the top right. Um, sometimes there is some low-hanging fruit. Maybe you can build a new service completely decoupled from the monolith um, to validate the new tech stack but you're not really learning how to modify your legacy at that point. You're just learning how to build new stuff. Um, so yeah, risk tolerant is basically we're going to start with something bigger and more complex because there's some bigger value connected to that. Risk averse is let's pick something smaller and simpler to get started to validate assumptions and not have any um, big catastrophes at the first start of our journey. I've seen companies take both approaches. I would generally say being a bit risk averse to start is preferable maybe, but the, the concern I have there is people start asking questions like, why have we taken a team of developers to work on something for six months? That's not very important. People start to ask questions like, they're just rebuilding some small piece in some new tech. So I think the communication piece is important there, explaining to other stakeholders who aren't so close to the code why you've started simple. Going for the top right-hand corner, things can go very wrong there. Um, what you're effectively saying is, we're going to modernize something that has a big piece of business value connected to it. And what I've seen go wrong is people start there, like, yeah, we'll modernize that really complex thing because we need to, we need to add some new functionality this year um, to improve our product. Because it's the first step of modernization, there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of things can go wrong. Realizing your on-prem can't connect to the cloud and your security team has a lot of questions that you need to answer first. And so that important business commitment you made suddenly starts getting pushed back from three months to six months to one year to, okay, now we're gonna rebuild it in the legacy because this is taking too long. So yeah, that first choice it's a pretty difficult one, so I think it's worth spending some time mapping out the options and thinking what's going to work right for your organization. I wouldn't say top left or bottom, bottom left or top right is a, a default. And then I'd like to talk about the value of workshops, about in-person gatherings, kind of touched on this already. So me and my friend Eduardo, we, we call these um, workshops, they're Kickstarter workshops, and the idea is to get people together for that first bit of modernization for your first three to six months to try and align on some of the bigger discussions, to do some event storming, and to try and put a bit of a roadmap together. Before these kind of workshops, um, you want to do some listening sessions, you might do some impact mapping, so that the idea is you go to this workshop, you map out the most complex part, um, 
you can use a variety of techniques here, but the goal is to come out of this feeling, okay, we're really confident that we can start that first slice of modernization. The challenge, though, is that you don't keep up the modernization after the workshop. We'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, this was a really interesting workshop we did for a company in Canada. Um, we had 60 people in the end. It started off as 20 and ended up at 60, but we figured it out. Um, it was actually good. What I would say, actually, on that point is we had different groups here, and they were all modeling the same parts of the business. So we could actually compare how different people came up with different, um, different flows and different domain boundaries. Uh, I think in this one, we had a salesperson who had a, a manual process involving multiple spreadsheets and 180 steps. And that was a big surprise to a lot of people. So again, from a modernization perspective, discovering that here. And then on the second day, we started help exploring how to modernize that with process modeling. But you can see here some of the yellow strips across the top. Had some good conversations with the whole group about what, what, what are the domain boundaries here. They weren't the final choices, but they were some starting points in exploring basic ideas. I think that's the key thing from there. And then, yeah, as I was saying, you know, the, I, I find these workshops can get people excited. It, it starts to feel like you know, things are happening. We haven't done event storming before. This time it's going to be different. Um, having a social event after the first night is usually quite good because you've got something from the first day to talk about. Yeah, this was good. I liked that bit. Um, and you can also get people a bit more aligned and motivated for the next few days. But still, the workshop's over. It's very easy for all of this to be wasted and people just go back to doing what they were doing before. Never an easy problem to solve, but the pattern we recommend and the pattern we've observed is what we call an architecture modernization enabling team. You've probably seen these kind of teams with a different name. Um, the name's not super important, but the idea is to use an enabling team in a team topology sense. So an enabling team doesn't do the modernization work. Their job is to try and keep things moving. And that can be very difficult because keeping a modernization effort moving can involve working with lots of different people. Might be working with the CTO, might be working with people who are less technical, maybe sales and marketing. Um, but it's also about coaching the teams, helping the teams to take stuff like event storming, translate that into code. Um, and one of the key things you can see here is that an enabling team isn't supposed to exist forever. The, the mindset of an enabling team is not, we're the experts to tell you how to modernize. It's, we're here to help teams do this themselves, to upskill the teams. And at some point, that team is no longer needed. It should be disbanded at some point. So that's basically it. Um, those were the ideas I wanted to share. Just give you a quick wrap up, and we might have time for questions. I forgot what time I started, so I don't know how long's left. Um, so basically, the key point I wanted to make at the start was um, being a successful company has pros and cons. Um, it's harder for other companies to compete with you, but you build up legacy processes, ways of working, abstractions in your code base, and that does give other companies an advantage because they can innovate faster than you. And what I see modernization as is companies wanting to be able to move faster with their products and stop architecture being less of a liability. Um, the second point is around how do we modernize. In my experience, it has to be far more than just a tech upgrade. Um, the technology alone will give some benefits, but it won't magically fix um, dependencies in your code, complexity that's built up over time, features that aren't working anymore. It won't address those issues. And it's also a chance to actually fix the full stack. Um, to improve the UX, to optimize manual processes. To address some of those issues, I talked about five tools, um, listening tools. I, I, I probably say that's the most important, if I'm honest, I think that's the most important tool. Um, and combining listening tools with other techniques like impact mapping to, to kind of gather the thoughts and insights that emerge into some structured visualized format. I think these days, um, Wardley mapping is becoming an essential tool allows you to connect your architecture to um, 
to the business strategy um, to connect those two worlds, and also to think about how are things evolving. That will give you a lot of insights about how, where, and how much to modernize, and even where you might not need to modernize. Then there's event storming. Really, you have to get into the domain. You really need to map out the, map out the nuts and bolts of your domain you're working in to identify what's not being used, what's too complex, where can things be improved, um, where is there a mismatch between business terminology and the terminology we use in the code. And then you need to start thinking about how you modernize the system and how much and in what fashion. And I think that's crucial as well, um, to not overinvest in the wrong areas and to not underinvest in the right areas. And then the final bit I talked about was the kickstarting and enabling. Probably the most difficult bit, um, going from not modernizing to modernizing. Those kickstart, those listening sessions can help to start warming people up to get some insights. Um, the Kickstarter sessions are a great way to bring people together, make some decisions, get alignment, and define that initial roadmap or start working on it. And if you feel that in your organization, that modernization isn't just going to happen with the way people currently work, people don't have the structures and support they need, you might want to form some kind of enabling team whose job it is just to look for things falling through the gaps, support people where needed, and play that um, important uh, enabling role. And that's everything. Thank you. Okay, cool. I'm happy to take any questions. Awkward silence for 10 minutes. That can work. I'm used to it. I'm British. Sure. Yeah, so um, on my list of tools, uh, tool four was event storming, which is a way to understand how, how your domain currently works, getting to the nuts and bolts. Event storming isn't the only tool. Um, Ian suggested domain storytelling. A technique I have used, a um, technique a lot of people use. I'd probably say domain storytelling has... Uh, the reason I would probably choose that was around group dynamics. Uh, sometimes it's nice to just sit around, model things step by step. With event storming, it's a bit more energetic, people moving around a lot. Um, there's more group dynamics to manage there. So I think both tools are effective. Um, it's worth learning both tools, and then you can figure out for the group I'm working with today, which one feels like it's going to get the most engagement. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, cool. I think we can finish there then. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate it.